I mean, let's begin with your early days. I mean, what are your first memories? Well, you see, I come from a family which is very religious and very uh, orthodox. And uh, my first memory of uh, cinema is uh, a film called Narsi Bhagat. Now, that's a film which was made in, you know, early 40s. And uh, my father used to go only to this kind of uh, films, mythologicals and uh, religious films. So he took me to that film. And I remember I thoroughly enjoyed that because we also had the uh, album of songs from that film. But why I remember that film most is that uh, for the first time as a child, I, I had a tremendous sensation of having understood something. And what I understood was that I saw this boy, uh, Narsi, who was feeding pigeons. And the camera, I remember the camera goes on to the pigeons and then there was a dissolve. The same pigeons uh, and the camera pulls back and you see now a grown up Narsi. And I suddenly, uh, uh, you know, as a child, uh, it was a revelation. I said, ah, the boy has become an adult. So that was a great sensation and uh, uh, that's my first memory of cinema. You know, somewhere I have read, you have mentioned that uh, there was a riot in the partition that sort of you witnessed and that sub somehow remained with you, those images, and later, of course, we'll come to Tamas later, but can you talk a little about that? It is true, it is true. And uh, uh, I, I, I remember that uh, day and that incident very well. Uh, the riots broke out. At night, uh, my uncles had not come. So there was a tremendous panic in the house. We were a, a joint family. And my aunts and everybody was, you know, very anxiously waiting for them. And ultimately, they arrived much later. But before that, when the uh, riots started, there was a, you know, terrific, uh, terrible sound of the doors and windows being banged shut. I remember that sound very well in that uh, huge building because we used to stay on the fourth floor of a huge uh, building which had about 90 offices in it and all that and that belonged to us in Karachi and it was bang opposite to this famous newspaper uh, in, in Karachi called Dawn okay so next day I suddenly realized that there was no sound everything was very quiet and for the first time I heard the word called curfew the curfew hai, curfew hai, aisa bolne lage. And then it was some, somewhere near the afternoon. It was very uh, hot at that time. And people were uh, talking in whispers. Though there was curfew outside, even within the house, they were talking in whispers. So tremendous silence and tremendous stillness. I can still feel the heat of that afternoon. And suddenly I heard a scream from somewhere from down. I rushed. Uh, out into the veranda and started peeping over the wall, you know, the little parapet wall. And I saw a man in a dhoti and shirt reeling on the ground like a somersault with the uh, uh, blood streaming uh, out of his back and just a flash of somebody, you know, just uh, disappearing in the alley and he was walking past. And uh, that was, and I was really trying to understand what was going on. And uh, my mother came and pulled me away from there. So it was like a flash. I went and I saw it. And my mother came and pulled me away. And I saw this, uh, this man being st uh, having been stabbed, rolling on the ground with that blood uh, streaming from his back. It's, 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 like a, it's like a snapshot, you know. And it has frozen in my memory forever. I can, you know, it gets uh, you know, replayed again and again whenever I think of that. And I can recall even the temperature of that day and what I felt looking at that kind of visual has never left me. In fact, as you very rightly said, when I met Tamas, I was not uh, trying to recreate events, I was trying to recreate a state of mind, I was trying to regain or recreate a sense of fright and fear and insecurity that one felt in those days. You know, you studied cinematography, I mean, unlike many other people, you consciously studied that. What made you, what were the motivating factors? Well, very strange. As I told you, I come from a very orthodox family. The cinema was not uh, something that 
you know, people from our family went to enjoy. But my younger uncles did. My father did not. He would allow me to go only to see religious films. It was in uh, somewhere near the high school that suddenly my bounds broke, you see. I became very interested in cinema. I wanted to go and see it all the time. And at home, I used to read uh, a magazine called Kalyan, published by Gita Press Gorakhpur. It's a very orthodox Hindu uh, religious magazine. So, uh, you know, and you had books like uh, uh, cinema, Manoranjan ya Vinash ka sadhan. You know, that kind of pamphlets they used to, uh, and I used to read them. And I used to wonder, I mean, cinema must be really, very really bad. But when I went to see it, I enjoyed it tremendously. I mean, it was really a very sensual experience for me. And uh, then at some stage, that experience overtook all the ideology that was being imbibed uh, through these books. And uh, I had a cousin who was a still photographer. And so I started getting interested in still photography. And it was in Udaipur when I had finished my high school. And, uh, you know, I was thinking what to do next. I came across a small advertisement in a paper. It says, the courses in cinematography. Now the combination of the word cinema and photography did the trick. I mean, I felt electricity in my body and I said, this is what I'm going to do. Not just photography, but cinema and photography. And of course, my father and everybody was very much against it. They thought, what sort of a line is this? And uh, my father said, okay, we'll think about it. First, you finish your college. I came to Bombay, tried to locate that institute. I couldn't. It was a very small thing somewhere taking place. But then I started making inquiries and finally located uh, the institute in Bangalore. And uh, after a lot of argument within the family, my father ultimately said, if our guru says, you go, you go. So we had a guru of the family. He came. He was very fond of me. He looked at my horoscope and he told my father, um, this boy will do something which has to do with art and technology, machines and things. So if he's talking about cinema and photography, I think it's okay, let him go. And my father kept his word, he let me go. And that's how I joined the institute in Bangalore. And yet your first learning experience in photography was with Mr. V.K. Murthy, whom you were assistant with? Or uh, yes, while I was in the institute, I must tell you one small anecdote. As I entered the institute, I met an ex-student of that place who seemed to be a very frustrated kind of a person. And he gave me a lecture on why I should not join the institute and why I should go back. And I started crying. I said, I made a great mistake. I came against the wishes of my father. But then the, uh, the teacher there, he said, forget it. You have come all the way. You better finish this course and do it. And I must thank him for encouraging me at that time. And that's how I went. Uh, and that's how I finished the course. But during that course, V.K. Murthy used to be a legend in the institute. Everybody used to talk about him because his achievement with Gurudath's films was tremendous. And uh, it's there that I saw the film Pyasa and Kagas Ke Fool in Bangalore. And I saw those films and I said, this is the person whom I'm going to approach, with whom I'm going to work, and he's going to be my guru. I decided in Bangalore itself. And I came here, I found his address, went to his house, I had rehearsed a few lines to say, which I said very quickly. And uh, I was very lucky, he said, okay, then you can start this evening. I didn't expect that. So he gave me an address. I went there in the studio, it was Filmalaya studio, and they were shooting a film called uh, uh, Ziddi, directed by Pramod Chakravarti. And that's how we started. And what was the transition then from that to Ankur? Can you capsule that, that phase? Yes, yes. Mr. Murthy, uh, belonged to a sort of a new thinking in Indian cinematography at that stage. Because he had also come from uh, what you might call the Fali Mistri school, which was very Hollywood oriented. Lighting was very good, precise, very, exp you know what you call expressionistic, glamorous, but very, very good. Good standard 
within that within those parameters and here was uh, mr murthy having been trained within that kind of lighting was trying to break through trying to establish more or less realistic uh, kind of uh, look to his films because that's what gurudath was perhaps also looking for so he was he he was breaking new ground at that time and uh, somehow or other i got along very well with him and he took a liking to me and he was very very encouraging uh, to me that way simultaneously what happened was that the film society movement began in bombay and i used to live in a guest house where uh, you know arun kaul and uh, several other people used to stay and they were the people who were trying to start film society movement in bombay so i became part of that movement from the very early stages and that's where for the first time i came across foreign cinema i came across the films that came from czechoslovakia uh in the uh, early 60s or mid 60s and they were the kind of films that uh, were really uh, you know kind of path breaking films for me the kind of stimulation you felt looking at those films was tremendous and here were the film where films where the camera was suddenly free from uh, tripods and uh, you know trolleys and things people were you know picking up cameras in their hands and running and things like that so it was the introduction of a new ariflex camera which can be handheld with a battery otherwise you needed generators and huge batteries to go with the cameras nagra came in so with this new technology the exposure exposure to new kind of cinema and the encouragement of this kind be constantly given by my guru you know the uh, ground was set for me to jump into a different dimension from the kind of uh, cinema i was actually working in but commercial cinema is a great learning ground you know the kind of situation as a technician you face and you have to tackle on day to day basis makes you a very good and resourceful technician and to that extent i must uh, thank that cinema for giving me a lot of uh, uh, range as a technician to tackle various things but essentially this is what helped me in molding my sensibility and at that time if i may continue uh, i met mr satyadev dubey he was doing theater and he was also a great friend of mr benegal and that's how i met mr benegal also so these two people together again were a very uh, uh, you know great influence on me dubey in terms of very modern thinking in drama i used to do his backstage i used to watch his uh, rehearsals so watching him rehearse and uh, talk to his actors handle dialogue and everything gave me a lot of insight into handling uh, these elements in a very modern way and uh, of course then the association with uh, uh, mr sham benegal began the sham is a tremendous mind and a very creative person at the same time but his his uh, analysis of things in analysis of films that we used to see in the film societies and things was was very enlightening and i must say it was talking to him on listening to him that slowly my uh, political education started so he is responsible for creating this political awareness in me and also uh, relating the cinema as an art with society that way i learned uh, a lot from what with him. what gave him that confidence that you were you know a newcomer and yet you shot ankur for him how how can you tell me how it yeah you see i had I, i had shot a couple of ad films for him and uh, uh, he had liked my work he had seen some of the work that i had done i had done uh, shantata code chalu hai with satyadev dubey which we co-produced and all this. so he had seen the work and earlier this ankur was to be done i think by mahajan then something happened dates ka kuch pata nahi kuch kya hua and then and ankur was to be made in black and white then he decided to make it in color and uh, uh, that's when i got the chance that's when he asked me if i would like to 
shoot. But before that, I had done documentaries with him. So he knew my work. He was aware uh, of my work with him. You know, first with Sham, you had a body of work, Ankur, Nisham, Bhumika. About 12 films. Janoon, you know. What was it that sort of, what, what were the, the experiences that you imbibed in them, which later came to use to you as a director? I mean, did you sort of be influenced, for instance, were you influenced by his directorial style, by his handling of the actors? Or was it something that was, you know, purely in, as a technical learning ground on, on, on the craft of filmmaking? It was, it was very integrated. Working with Sham was a very integrated experience. By integrated experience, what I mean is that when the discussions were taking place, when the script was being written, the scenes were being discussed, and various other aspects of the scenes were being, uh, you know, openly debated, I used to be part of that. He never treated me merely as a, a photographer who will be given a brief to light up a scene or set up a camera or something like that. Never. And I was also, in a bad temperament, very interested in the whole process. So working with Shyam was going through the process of filmmaking and not just coming in as a cameraman a month before the shooting started. It was not like that. I used to be, uh, you know, part of several discussions. And uh, what happened was that whenever we went for the scene, and I must say that Sham was at that time also trying to break away from the standard commercial kind of filmmaking. He was also trying to develop a new vocabulary for himself. So it was very interesting that when we went to shoot a scene, for example, I would, I would insist that Sham explain the entire scene to me and then stage it because we were shooting mostly on locations. So I would like to know whether I could maintain a certain continuity of light, what kind of lighting scheme I should adopt uh, if a scene was to be staged in a particular way. And Sham is a great improviser. He never prepares uh, his uh, you know, storyboards and things like that. He, he thinks on the spot, he interacts with actors, gets the best out of them. And the whole scene, you can see the scene emerging, taking shape in front of your eyes. So he's a great improviser that way. So he used to improvise the scene over there where I will watch. And then I will constantly look at whether it's possible how to light it up. And if there were any problems, I'll tell him. So it was always uh, working together in evolving the scenes. And this, I think, somewhere uh, gave me the confidence that it, when I decided to make a film that I will be able to direct it also. Because working with Shyam was, uh, you know, that way, uh, not only as a cameraman, but it was also part of being the whole process. You know, your first film was Akrosh. It was, I think, uh, also the film that won the Golden Peacock in yes. the yes. International Film Festival then. What made you choose that subject? I mean, you could have... You know, I'm sure there must have been other subjects. What was it in Akrosh that sort of said to you that this is going to be my debut film? In fact, there was another subject before that. It was a Marathi novel called Chani, which I had worked on, written by Mr. Khanolkar. But uh, due to some circumstances, Khanolkar then gave that novel to Mr. V. Shantaram, who made the film later on. I was very disappointed, frankly. And uh, Mr. Tendulkar, I knew very well because Shantata Kot Chalwai, we had done, and with, ten, with Dubey, you know, there was an association in theatre. At that time, he was doing uh, a research. He was on Nehru Fellowship, uh, working on a thesis of emerging patterns of violence in society as expressed in theatre. So he was doing a lot of research on violence in society. And once we were sitting together, and he mentioned an incident of how during a communal riot, a tribal was, some tribals were brought from the jungles near Thane. And uh, some interested parties made them stand at a particular place, gave them something to drink or whatever, and just asked them to fire arrows into the crowd. Okay? And it was a communal riot. These people didn't even know who they were fighting against or what. They were just carrying out orders. So, one of the guys, one of the tribals, was arrested because some arrows were found in the body of somebody and he was arrested. And people who had brought him just disappeared. 
they left him as it is. So I, the, the theme stuck in my mind, that this, the theme of a person who has no means, who is helpless, how he gets exploited and how he has no recourse to justice and, uh, and, and, and he, his life is destroyed like that. That was the starting incident. But uh, it was not something that we wanted to go on. And slowly, slowly, uh, you know, ideas were being discussed between me and Tendulkar. And uh, one day, I remember I was coming, I was returning in a taxi after shooting an ad film when an idea struck me. And I rang up Mr. Tendulkar. We discussed it. And that's how uh, Akrosh was born. But after that, you know, it was all Tendulkar. Do, do you think that last scene, you know, the scene well, where sort of, you know, he beheads his sister and, and that, that, that cry that, that sort of almost symbolizes the, the title of the film. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little about that? I mean, how you saw, was it there in the script or again, uh, I mean, how did you build it up to that kind of a drama? Well, you see, the building it up was because I also in the first uh, film, I did not uh, take any recourse to uh, storyboarding or anything. I was, as I have always done, I was just following uh, my emotional response to that uh, story. And uh, the whole thing was born like that. I mean, for me, these, uh, some major scenes come as flashes. And Tendulkar had suggested uh, enough in the, in the script. So it was purely, you know, instinctual response to the story that, uh, that we did this. If you were to make Akrosh again, after having made so many films, would you have made it any differently now? I, I don't know, but maybe not. Maybe not. Akrosh was a very, very uh, uh, satisfying experience as a filmmaker to me. Of course, then came Ar Satya, which gave you further recognition. Yes. But uh, again, fact, uh, after Akrosh, I did a film called Vijeta. Right, Vijeta, which, was, which, which of course was very was, different. Yeah, which was a different And, and then I did a Kapoor. film, uh, uh, Gandhi. Where you were a second unit director. Second actually. unit director and cameraman. cameraman. And in fact, uh, Attenborough. Attenborough was in fact, uh, that's the time when you won the, the award, I think, isn't it? When Akrosh was, uh, when you were shooting Gandhi, you won the award for Akrosh. Yes, yes. I yes. was then in Delhi, so I know. <laughs> yes, <that. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very much. But uh, no, let's come to Ar hmm. Satya, hmm. Uh, because it, it represents a kind of a, you know, a theme with which you developed much later on, and, and a theme hmm. of. Hmm. There has been some, uh, you know, sort of criticism, one can use that word, that the theme of Ar Satya actually has a lot of parallels to commercial Indian cinema, where an idealistic cop who faces a moral dilemma takes on the establishment, so to speak. I think that kind. Of, yeah, I have heard that kind of criticism, and I think it's uh, it's uh, based on a very hurried reading of the film. I would say that uh, Earth Satya was born out of a short story by Panvalkar, and Tendulkar had suggested that story to me, and uh, that story is only one scene in the film right now, and we just say that if we take this character and develop him, what will happen to him, and the whole thing was born. Now. Coming to the criticism of this, one criticism is that it is very near the commercial uh, framework. The other one is that it is a very fascistic film because it suggests somewhere uh, that uh, the democratic process is being uh, uh, subverted and it is not bringing in the results and also it supports uh, policemen. It, it sympathizes with the policemen who is the arm of the state and uh, therefore the arm of the state's coercion and therefore it should not be supported. <laughs> you know, th right. this, this sort of a thing. But I don't think it is true. A, the, uh, the policeman, the police officer in my film is not an idealistic one. If you see it, it's not an idealistic one. He goes to bars where he gets a free drink. He, he, he goes to the cabarets. He, he, he's not about uh, these uh, small uh, uh, sort of weaknesses. 
In fact, even at the end, he goes to meet Ramashetty to strike a deal with him. He's, he's not an idealistic person. The fact is that he was an idealistic person. But when his cop father forced him into it, he tasted a little bit of power. And that changed his perspective totally. He is a sensitive person, I would say. He reads uh, poetry. You know, he appreciates these uh, uh, more finer things of life. But the fact is, he also has tasted power as a cop. So he is not an idealistic cop anymore. But within, when his power is challenged, when he suddenly realizes that he, the power that he feels he has is more of an illusion than reality, that's when his uh, uh, realization uh, comes in. And therefore, I would say that it's very, very different from the normal commercial, uh, you know, black and white kind of a character who's idealistic and takes on the establishment. In fact, he doesn't take on the establishment. In my film, he does not take on the establishment. In fact, he tells his girlfriend that it's the establishment that is kind of castrating him. He's feeling like a, like a, a napunsak. So there's no question of uh, you know him being like the any other angry. You know, person. in both Akrosh and in Arthatya, you used uh, Om Puri's face, the close-ups on it, to great effect. How much do you work with actors to create this kind of uh, intangible, you know, moods, moments which are sort of not there in the script, and yet you want to communicate whether it is anger or frustration or helplessness. In in uh, uh, Arthatya. Om Puri's face was uh, very much the keynote of my film. You know, I got to have that sur, a keynote hona chahiye, key element which on which I hang all my work in that particular film. And in this case, it was Om Puri's uh, face. In fact, the producers at one stage suggested that I should take Nasir, and I said no, I must have Om. And I'm glad that they accepted this. But I, I, I consider uh, the actor and the actress, the particularly those who are essaying the main roles, extremely important. They are, uh, they are, you know, my, uh, you know, medium through which I enter the story. Their faces become my landscape. It is through their faces, through the little subtle, uh, you know, nuances of expression and uh, both on the face as well as when they deliver the dialogue that I tell uh, the final moments of my story because I believe in, in moments. A film must achieve some moments where the plot and uh, the progression of the story does not matter. You must arrive at a moment, a poetic moment which is essentially a moment of truth. The progression of plot or everything doesn't matter at that moment. And you can create these moments when you have uh, the actors of tremendous uh, sensitivity and uh, brilliance. You know, you're a very visual person in the sense that you come from a camera man's background and all that. And yet, when you made Party, it was more of a didactic, uh, you know, uh, dialogues. Did you find a contradiction there? Did you find that you were deliberately trying to take an ideological situation and you forgot your your uh, heritage as a you know your legacy as a cameraman and went into as a as a dramatist? Into no, that? you see, when I when I make a film, when I direct a film, I direct it as a filmmaker. It's not a cameraman directing a film. It's a filmmaker making a film who also happens to be a cameraman. And in that case, my uh, my sensibility as a director dominates over. Uh, my uh, myself as a cameraman. It always prevails over it. And I know as a cameraman that I cannot allow the visual quality or the or the visuals as are generally known, which means dramatic lighting, you know, dramatic framing and that sort of thing, take precedence over the characters in the film. For me, the human being is always more important in the story than uh, these little aesthetic uh, uh, you know, elements. They are important. I'm not saying that they're unimportant. They are important, but they are important to the extent that they help me bring the human being to the fore, to bring the human experience into the foreground. They must be supportive uh, 
elements. I don't see them as ends in themselves whenever I make a film. You know, I'm now going to talk to you, but I'm going to skip a couple of films and come to your most, you know, mega production, which was Tamas, which we began this interview with. Uh, what was it in Tamas that you sort of, you know, you told me that you wanted to achieve that one mood as a child, but what was it in the in Hisham Sani's novel that got you interested in it? I mean, into such a huge so, well, major... So the basic thing that Tamas said, and uh, which I found was reflecting my ideological position also, was that, that whenever religious sentiments are manipulated of the communities, a great tragedy results. And particularly when that manipulation takes place with the objective of uh, achieving a political end, it is even worse, number one. Number two, because having come, you know, being a victim of the partition, one knew what happened uh, during that period and to the family. And the other thing was that in every community, we have these small militant groups who try to project themselves as the spokespersons or sp spokesgroups of the entire community. And they try to impose their will on the community by sheer muscle power and manipulation of their religious sentiments and all the communities have that and it is important for us to see and recognize those uh, groups and not allow them to dominate our lives and disturb the peace these were the two things that appealed to me immensely then of course the beautiful characters that vision recreated a very uh, very uh, sort of uh, unmelodramatic manner in which he he conveyed those characters, he portrayed those characters, and through the situations, he conveyed these uh, you know ideas, was tremendous. There was a certain simplicity, which which managed to achieve the kind of depth which you never achieve with uh, with the dramatic rhetoric, and these were the qualities in the novel that I uh, appreciated immensely. There was a certain simplicity, certain honesty. Uh, and you see, he wrote that novel in 1975, uh, and the thing took place in 1947, nearly 30 years after that, after the incident. So he had the advantage of hindsight. He reflected upon the events. He did not just uh, uh, recreate them in a sensational manner. So there was a certain maturity in the way he looked back at the recent history. These are the things that appeal to me very much in Tamas. You know, when the program was made and it was being telecast, there was physically an attack on you. It was almost a call to ban that film by the right-wing uh, BJP yes. and you know yes. those yes. elements. Yeah. Um, how did you react to that? I mean, what, what what is your reaction to such censorship, strong-arm tactics to create? Well, I I am totally against it. I was threatened. There was police sitting in my house for seven weeks constantly. I used to move out with a guard. People came to my house, uh, you know, physically attacked me. I managed to, uh, you know, escape. I was not there at that time. But the fact is the, the level of intolerance and the, uh, and the level of violence threatened at that time, I had never uh, anticipated. 